All right. I think that may have been the fastest we have ever gone through a book of the Bible. Uh, we've spent like a year or so on Gospels and Genesis and Exodus, but only two weeks on Leviticus. So, <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was enough. <laughs> it, it was enough. I just wanted, because we zoomed so fast through Leviticus, I was curious if you all had any like lingering thoughts about the book um, and kind of its content. So, or is it just Chekhov did there, done that? We kind of understand what it is. Mm. Uh, are there other things in Leviticus that would be interesting to know? I mean, from your uh, that you would recommend us to take a look at. I mean, you're asking the Bible nerd who went to school to study this for three years, so that's a dangerous question. Um, I think it's one of those that Leviticus is good to have a tab on. Because it there was a lot of things that relate in other places of the Bible, but it's more that like I have notes at the bottom of of the page, and I think a few of you may or have that same thing and may have my same Bible. Yeah, Sometimes I just keep my thumb there because I'm like referencing back and forth what's being talked about. Okay. Sometimes okay. it's helpful when like Jesus is getting into debates with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sometimes it's good to be able to like flip back and forth and see what they're referencing. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I feel like I pulled out some of the things that have the biggest impact on our theology and some of the things that we look at. The rest yeah. of it's just kind of interesting, <laughs> uh, but just kind of, but there's not really the same like take home value Bible study life application. It's more in a like historical, let's go to a lecture kind of interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, you have a late breakfast. Yeah. So that means just carrying on with the story, we're going from Leviticus to numbers. And what I gave you all for a reading isn't actually a very good introduction because Le Numbers is kind, I think of it is almost a weird oddball of a book. It is, you hear about the 40 years of wandering in the desert, right? When, like thinking back, like Lent is that we're about to go to, it's Jesus spent 40 days in the desert because the Israelite people wandered for 40 years in the desert. That's what the book of numbers is it takes place over that block of 40 years but there's not really a narrative introduction into this book so i gave us two sections to read for today but before we get to discussing that i thought i would give you a little bit of introduction i i don't once again i don't have a powerpoint slide but just some of the things that, to get us used to this book and kind of discuss the little sections that we have jumping around today. So we're just going to dip our toes into this book for uh, for now. So any questions or thoughts before I jump into my like brief introduction in numbers? Because um, I know I had you read kind of an odd selection today. So any initial thoughts? Is there a reason it's called numbers? Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> so are there are i guess i one of my other questions is when you think about the book of numbers is there any story that immediately pops out like when we think of exodus we think of the 10 commandments and that whole story do you have any association with this book at all or is it one of the ignored books of the bible i don't think i've ever read anything in numbers before okay but i must have class in Old Testament. Sort of so. ignored it. Just never really read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, no, so it sounds like it's generally ignored. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, then buckle in because Numbers actually has some of the weirder stories in the Old Testament, which is why I love it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you all know, I like some of the odd stories. This book has a talking donkey in it, which is just one of my favorite in the Bibles of a talking donkey, which makes the movie Shrek a little bit biblically accurate. 
so let's jump in with a brief introduction. So I was, um, this is a combination of the introduction in my Bible and I was do trying to do some quick internet research. Evidently, this book has some of the oldest fragments from the entire um, uh, Torah. So it's one of those that, I think I've said this before, our version of the first five books of the Bible, it comes from what's called the Aleppo Codex, which is the oldest intact version that we have. And it's considered the authoritative one. The Dead Sea Scrolls are older than that. Like I said, like that, some of those scrolls have differences in it, which creates some interesting questions of which one's more trustworthy. But there are fragments of the Book of Numbers that are some that are even older than that. So it's thought that some of these stories, or at least by what we have, some of the stories in Numbers are considered very ancient just because we have very old copies of them, which is interesting. But like all the other books we've been reading, it is also one of those that's been sewn together over the years with different forms. Um, kind of like ec or like numbers the one of the big editors in the book of numbers is the priestly source uh so there's a lot of priestly commentary in, in it but there's also what is called the old epic so we are going to ignore most of the priestly material and just focus on the old epic because that's where the stories are so in form and format it's kind of like taking some like the story style of early Genesis and smashing it together with Leviticus. So there's a lot of numbers uh, and there's a, there's a few laws in, in and out of s very big story chunks. So we're gonna jump from story to story and kind of skim over past the laws and the numbers. So Gary, your question, why is it called the book of numbers? It's because the two big sections in the book of numbers revolves around a military census. So when we ended Exodus, remember God said, okay, like I'll be with you, but we have to head out from this area. So they're going to leave Sinai, which means they're going to start interacting with other tribes. And one of the first things that they do is they take a census of all the fighting aged people. And so that's at the beginning of numbers. And then it's about at the midway point in numbers, they have to do it again for specific reasons. And so those are two big, or that is kind of the dividing line that organizes numbers is that they spend time talking about the number of people. That comes from the Greek translation is when it gets this, uh, the name numbers, because it focuses so much on the numbers for these two big chunks. However, in Hebrew, in like the Hebrew name for this book is called In the Wilderness. So it folk, the Hebrew idea of this book focuses more on the stories and the old epic, which is what we are going to follow. The Septuagint was more focused on the priestly source and the numbers and the rules. So pausing there for any, any thoughts of kind of that, overview of what we're looking at is the 40 years of wandering and they're going to be some battles because we're taking some military senses. <laughs> All right. So a little bit more of, um, Larry, I was looking this up specifically because I know you're our numbers guy and you always <laughs> ask about numbers. <laughs> and this is a are, there's a lot of discussion about this because it's the book of numbers. And the question is, how do we deal with these military censuses? So I didn't have us read the census for today. That basically starts in chapter one. It just jumps right into it. And I'm thought we don't need more of like reading who's in which clan. So they take the census number based on the 12 tribes, counting the number of people. It's the sum total of the people that this book comes to is 600,000 soldiers, which would translate to 1.5 to 2 million people in this group of pe nomadic people wandering in the desert. And mm -hmm. basically scholars are saying, 
This is greatly exaggerated or entirely fabricated because there is no archaeological evidence that a small city amount of people was just moving together in the desert. There's just no evidence of that. And two million people moving as one would be noticeable. <laughs> and so the question is, how do we deal with the numbers here? There are some that were just saying that like, oh, people start attacking on zeros ad hoc and just like grew the number to be that big. Um, but one theory that I actually found fascinating is that they have a different counting system that looks similar to ours, but we don't understand. So it's like if if you were looking at Roman numerals and didn't know what the letters meant, it's something similar to that because um, Hebrew doesn't have specific numbers. Even in English, like our numbers come from the Arab alphabet originally. So like the way our numbers look come from our interaction with the Arab world. The Hebrew, the way to count in Hebrew is just using the letters of the alphabet, kind of like in Greek. So we don't necessarily, we think we know what these numbers mean, but there's an assumption that we may not actually know how their counting system works, which would give us an erroneous number. Or um, it's just, um, or they're just making it up altogether. So take your pick of like how this is working but what we know is that like they're gonna put a lot of numbers out there and make their troops sound really big and that's just probably not the case either we don't know how they're counting or something else is going on we don't know what it is which leads people to say that with all that is going on in this book it is more about the theology of what is happening rather than looking at it as a history book and I think that is an important approach here, is that because we know these numbers just aren't accurate, uh, as we jump in, I think it's good to think about what is the text saying about people and about God, not did this happen or did this happen this way? Kind of like we've said before, like not trying to nail it down to history, but kind of looking at what is being discussed. So that's my brief whirlwind introduction. <laughs> what do you all think? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, Helen. Uh, I had heard it said that uh, when they were discussing numbers, um, uh, the amount of people, that um, the Israelites were not very good at numbers and that they really hadn't uh, really developed a system and that they just knew there were a lot of people and they expressed it in big numbers because they really didn't know. Mm -hmm. There is, I only have one issue with that and that assumes that people in the past weren't as smart as we are today. Mm -hmm. And my oh. general assumption is people are smart. It's just whether or not they have the same tools that we have. Right. And so one, one of the other suggestions that I think would go along similarly to that is the difference between writing a number and taking a tally. Mm. So it's like, okay, you have like this clan has this many people in it, give or take. So how many clans do we have? And just kind of taking a rough estimate rather than a precise number. Mm -hmm. Okay. which is one of the thoughts of what they were doing is they were taking a general tally. It's not like they were counting grains of rice. Mm -hmm. So, Thank I, you. yeah. But generally speaking, I would always assume that ancient people are equally as intelligent as we are. They just did things differently that may not make sense to us. Well, I think that was the idea when they expressed that they hadn't really developed it like yeah. I think the Arab system was quite well developed, as far as I know, mm -hmm. but I, that they, they, they were interested in, as you say, other things. Yeah. All right. So the last thing that I'll say before jumping in is one of the big things. So this is just the thing to like keep in your back pocket when reading all of these stories. One of the main things of the Book of Numbers is, is human rebellion what to do when 
at this point, they have the majority of, like, they have Leviticus theoretically. They have the way to do things. Are they able to follow the rules? Which the rules are partly just because they are rules for good living, and sometimes it is literally identity markers. You are to be set aside as a people different from the world. So follow these rules so they know that you are different. Can the people do this or will they fail? That is the all, the whole will they, won't they, they of this entire book. So with that, let's jump in kind of partway into the story. I think I told you all to jump in midway through chapter three, correct? Yeah. Verse Mid four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So some of this is just introduction on kind of like setting up some of the players that are going to come in in the second half of the story. So, and I picked this one partly because we've discussed this a little bit before. What does it mean to redeem the firstborn? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I'm curious for you all, did this give any sort of clarity to the, uh, the idea of redeeming the firstborn? Sue, no, this made it more confusing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. I I was confused by it because it sounded like some of the people I don't I didn't know what they were doing in the beginning with them, whether they were sacrificing an animal because they had what was the point of substituting mm-hmm. if you didn't do anything. I'm I was not clear. But then they talked about paying for mm-hmm. some of the people. So I don't I couldn't really figure out. What the diff- were everybody getting? Was everybody get? No, no, not everybody was getting paid for. So, I I don't just okay. there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other questions of what's going on in this l- little snippet. Well, yeah. they certainly were very precise about the numbers, though. Again, you know, two hundred and seventy-three leftovers. You know, yeah. that they've got to do something about. And I'm, I, you know, I'm just confused. Who paid whom for what, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And where did the money come from? The shekels. <laughs> yeah. Other questions about this? All right. So let's talk. Oh, yeah, Gary. Well, yeah, I'm a little confused about we, we focus on the firstborn, where the firstborn separated out for a particular assignment and not part of the group? Mm-hmm. Were they, they just started counting? Or did they just count the started counting the first one? I, I'm kind right. of confused why you just take firstborn. They probably had four, five, six, eight children. Mm-hmm. All right. So let's start setting up how they're kind of organizing their society. So this is partly like they are a group of people like remember they're still actually fairly fresh out of Egypt at this point and they are used to living in the hierarchical system in Egypt where they were at the bottom just grouped entirely at the bottom. So they are creating a new society and the question is how are they going to organize. Can they exist with everybody at the same level where everyone's equal. We already saw that that kind of didn't work. Everyone was equal and kept bringing their problems to Moses and Moses was overwhelmed. So he's already started adding some layers of strata. Mm -hmm. So here we are adding more strata to society because certain things need to get done. So the first thing that they do at the beginning and like chapter one and two is they're counting the number of fighting aged people. How many people, if we come across another group, can go to war for us because you need certain people to protect your people and then certain people that that actually can like engage in battle. But if you have all of your fighting age people going to battle, there's other things like if they all get wiped out, they are going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're making some precautions for some other Mm -hmm. things that need to get done. Hey, Mary Ellen. Mm -hmm. We're, we are we just covered an introduction to numbers we are jumping into the redemption of the firstborn and kind of discussing why they're setting this up okay i'm gonna be snacking sorry nope you're good 
So they set up the fighting age people, but the thought, but the next question is, wait, hold on. If some people are fighting, we still need people to take care of the tabernacle that we set up. So who's going to, who's going to do all the priestly stuff? Who's going to be wrangling the sacrifices? Who's going to be protecting the priests? Who's going to do all the, the like needed things? So the thought is that, as we've discussed before, the firstborn son is the one that God is like God's personal property. The first one is mine. There's a sacrifice that uh, proves that they're not going to do child sacrifice, but it's kind of the dedication. We're going to kill the animal instead of the firstborn son, but that shows that we have dedicated the firstborn. This is kind of a second step is, well, if the firstborn belongs to God, then shouldn't the firstborn be the one that does priestly duties uh, at the tabernacle? Aren't they supposed to be the ones helping Aaron and his sons? And so that's the thought. I mean, I feel like in European culture, there was a similar thing of like, you would have the firstborn who had inherited the property. You would give one son to the ministry and one would be a soldier. And you kind of had like those roles that like most families would send one to each one, right? In this thinking, the firstborn has that elevated status. So the firstborn would be the one who you would send to do the priestly duties. However, this, what's being talked about is the substitution. So not every family is losing their firstborn son who is supposed to manage the family business as we've kind of talked about in Genesis. Instead, we are going to dedicate just one clan of people to do the priestly duties. And so that's how the Levites get this elevated status. Mm -hmm. They don't inherit property. They don't have a lot of other responsibilities. Instead, the Levites are going to do everything for the tabernacle. They are the ones that will unload and load up all the different portable pieces when they head out. So they're, while other people are packing up their, their homes and getting the children wrangled, putting all the cooking equipment together, the Levites are going to be the ones who's like rolling up the tent and putting the Ark of the Covenant in uh, like the poles there. So the Levites are the ones that are going to carry it. They're the ones that are going to carry the, the altar and the incense and all of that. So that is your workforce for taking care of the tabernacle. So why they take the census is they're like, OK, theoretically, if we dedicated all of our firstborns, what number of people would that be? Okay, so that's the number of Levites that we should have. And then they looked at the number of Levites and they realized the Levites have less people than there are firstborns in kind of this whole group of people. So that's why they then say, hey, give money for your firstborn and give it to Aaron. And that's going to be the money that the Levites and Aaron and his family live off of because those people aren't going to make a living because their sole duty is to take care of all the holy stuff. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> does that put that a little bit more in context? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. The thing is, this will maintain throughout scripture. So once they set up shop and they like actually create a nation, the Levites are still the ones that will do all the business in and around the temple. And why this connects is in stories like if you remember the Good Samaritan, there's a few people that pass by the uh, the guy who gets beat up and left on the side of the road. The first one is a priest. The mm -hmm. second one is a Levite, the one who's doing all of this maintenance work. They're not all necessarily priests, but they're the people taking care of the thing. And then the third one is the Samaritan. Mm -hmm. So the Levites are a big player, and they have been already, because remember, they were the ones not worshiping the golden calf. Mm -hmm. And they will have many roles to play in the story to come, but they have this kind of elevated status. And so I'm curious to reflect on what does it, or to what does, what do you all think about act, like intentionally elevating a class of people to kind of be a holier group of people meant to take care of some of the things that need to get done 
Um, therefore, you're going to have a specialized class of people with this elevated status. What do we think about that? Mm -hmm. Does it not suggest that that status must be something that's learned mm -hmm. rather than inborn or based upon lineage, you know? Does I mean, both it... and because <laughs> the Levites, I mean, it's a, you're in the clan or you're not. Like, it's, yeah. um, I would think of it more like. If your father was a blacksmith, you will become a blacksmith. Mm -hmm. You have to learn the blacksmith trade. They had to learn how to do all this, but it is still kind of a hereditary thing. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the Levites are a little different from the Israelites, huh? <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> and we don't like differences. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it, uh, it seems like the only reason certain people were considered priests or priestly was because it, uh, Aaron was the brother of Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, anyway, Aaron. I mean, <laughs> Aaron didn't earn his position necessarily. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and he did. Say, I'm really good at this, so I should do it. <laughs> no, in fact, Aaron's already messed up a few times. <laughs> well, this must have been decided by the group also to do this because they needed somebody to take care of the temple, or they, they, uh, and they needed needed that done. And it doesn't sound like they get, like they're getting out of work. They're still doing a lot of work, and it's done by them. And the people don't have to do it, though, the rest of the people. I don't know. I think it's probably, it must have seemed fair to them in that respect. Yeah. Yeah, Mary Ellen? Well, I have a couple of reactions. Um, one, um, there are going to be Levites who do not want this job, who um, are better suited for farming or um, a craft skill or whatever, and they are targeted into this role with no choice. So you're going to have some people who are doing the job who are very unhappy about doing the job. So you get different attitudes in how they perform their job, whether um, they see it as a gift from above and special status or um, they see it as, as an onerous thing to um, that they can't escape, they can't get out of. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the other side of it, um, I can see um, an arrogance and entitlement and, um, you know, that as the firstborn sons are trained to do this work, I mean, they are definitely of an elevated status, and you know, I can I can just see problems with um, their attitude or their belief of how important they are. So that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Larry. Well, not all of the Levites had to be involved though in the temple work. You know, for example, the women they had nothing to do with it. They weren't even allowed. To. In mm -hmm. the place, you know, so the there may have been choices among, and was it just the firstborn that were going to serve in the temple, or what could it be others? So it's one of those. So the Levites are a substitution. So the rest of the eleven tribes, they okay. don't get temple duty, but basically the Levites, all of them. Even if you're not firstborn, you kind of have a firstborn status because mm. you're representing someone else's firstborn. Oh, okay. It's not a like you, it's not like, oh, I'm the firstborn of this family, but it's one of those that uh they would all have that elevated special chosen status. But um you're you're right in that there's there's uh, it's um, I would have to do more research uh, to see if they like rotated through their duties, but there would still be things they would have to do to like live a life. Like, yes, the women yeah. are doing homemaking duties. They have families. 
they have cattle and flocks. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that's being said here is that the Levites flocks and cattle are some of the things that are to be used in the temple, the, that they, their kind of herds belong to God as well. So they can be used for sacrifices at any time. So it's seems, so the whole thing of like the Levites don't live for themselves. They are kind of um, imagine having a brand by God and God saying, okay, you're my property now. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's both an elevated status, but it also has elevated responsibilities. Mm -hmm. it, you know, they, with all the sacrificing of animals for all these people, the substitution thing, it seems like they would be killing an awful lot of animals. I mean, did, did they eat them? I mean, did, they didn't just throw them in the garbage or anything, right? They ate them. Yeah. Okay. So with most of the sacrifices, there is some part of the animal that gets eaten. So sacrifices are actually one way to feed both Aaron and his family and the Levites. Okay. They get the best part of the food, but then the family bringing forward the sacrifice, they get the rest. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to get the prime or the, the like the New York steak strip, but they, they might get some of the other parts of the animal. So part of, I mean, this is, always think of these, the sacrifices to God is kind of like a holy butcher shop. <laughs> <laughs> that, like, like that's the way they got their meat. And they, the, the priests were the specialists to do it in a clean, healthy, honorable way. And so it's, it's a combination we don't really think about. But I would be curious to see how many, like, how many animals would have to be sacrificed if we did it locally for us to eat the amount of meat that we do? Like, guaranteed, they're eating less meat than us. They just have a closer one-to-one -one relationship with it. And I'm very grateful that I am not your butcher. I probably wouldn't have this job if my if that was part of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious to think if we have a corollary today, this is the one thing I do find interesting. We like to think ourselves as a more equal society uh, that's a meritocracy of like you, uh, your hard work will get you as far as your hard work will get you in life. Um, but we do have certain professions with elevated statuses and there are, not that they're not learned skills, but there's a certain sense where if your parents do something, it's easier for you to go into that field. So what are some of the fields that we give elevated status to today? Doctors. Yeah. Yeah, very much. That's probably one of the careers that has uh, some of the most prestige in it, I would argue, in our society. Badly eroded at present. So. <laughs> True. But I think it, that's actually an interesting corollary because I feel like if your parent is a doctor, you almost have, uh, there's an, not saying that you don't put hard work in to learn that path, but I know a lot of people that I went to school with that had parents as doctors, they became doctors as that's well. True. That's That's true. But that's, I think, uh, was more of an interest thing. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the ones that dropped out of school in your freshman year of medical school were often doctors' sons. Oh, yeah? You know, they just didn't like it. Or, that's know. fair. So what are other careers with kind of elevated status in our society? Well, I think clergy. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. people, that are, people that are ministers. <clears throat> clergy, you know, in different churches, some, some more than others. Yeah, not, not the way it used to be, I don't think. Well, I don't know. I think there's a lot of respect given to, to some. Yeah. Uh-huh. I don't know if it follows a family pattern as much as doctors, but maybe some. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Joe, what were you saying? Celebrities. Oh, celebrities, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh, 
for? Uh, celebrities, people who are uh, famous. Celebrities. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. hmm. <clears throat> Athletes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful people. <laughs> yeah. And um, I'm going to uh, this. <laughs> I have um, adopted family in England, and they consider the um, Kennedy um, political clan our American royalty. And the first time they mentioned that to me, I, I didn't understand. I was shocked. It was like, what are you talking about? We don't have, she was talking about our American royalty. And, and we don't have any royalty. What's this all about? But um internationally that is how the kennedy clan is seen except for this new guy that's uh, kind of crazy mm -hmm. <laughs> <Who's that? laughs> uh, but i do i mean so it's <laughs> i do find that interesting actually like thinking about the about JFK Jr.'s death was um, publicized in a way that I think it's interesting that I'm wondering if other sons of politicians would. That's going to think about that one. Um, so it's, I would argue that our society today is actually very stratified. And we found that actually a lot of nepotism in Hollywood is actually fascinating when you start seeing like who is who has famous parents or like semi-famous parents mm -hmm. um, that you see that like hard work gets you places, but also there's a certain amount where it help, helps to have the lineage. But also mm -hmm. the thought of like the people we give respect because there is like a specialized task that's being done. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's at a certain point where specialization, once you get to a certain point, specialization is really helpful in a society because mm -hmm. frankly as much as i am with small home repairs i'm not qualified to fix the plumbing in my house i am always very grateful to have uh an actual plumber come in and fix things mm -hmm. and so it's interesting the difference between we need someone to carry the ark of the covenant because someone has to so let's create order and a mechanism so we know that when we move there's always going to be a person there to carry the ark of the covenant and we don't have to have this discussion every time and then the second step of when do human egos get put in and or like res extra respect <laughs> given for people with these specialized roles that can turn started with a utility but now have elevated status <laughs> so uh, it, it seems like people who have a lot of money are unless they're really mm -hmm. like Musk is that his name? What's, what's the name of the person who did that car? Who's the richest person in the world? So they they oh. elevated status in some kind of way money they've made mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah. So with that, the last thing I'm going to fixate on in this little chapter is actually a part that I didn't have you read. And I just want you all to know this because it will, we're kind of laying some of the groundwork for the conflict to happen later. So today's <laughs> a lot of like laying groundwork here. So one group of people that is a subsection of the Levites. So they've counted all the Levites and that's like the big clan, but there's like many clans inside of it. There's a group called the Korites and their job, if you, uh, you will see chapter four begins with discussing specifically this group within the Levites. This group is specifically responsible for carrying the Ark of the Covenant the table, uh, like the dishes and all the special things, the incense burners, all the things that are actually in the tabernacle, this clan of people is specifically tasked with carrying those things around. 
So not only are the Levites supposed to like care for the entire tabernacle, help with bring offerings in and everything, we have one clan that is going to carry the special stuff. And that's all I'm going to tell you now because it comes into play later. I just need you all to know that in setting out these things, there's a special group for this. <laughs> all right. Um, the last, actually, I lied. There's one other thing that I do find interesting. It comes at the end of chapter four. All the people that are serving in the tabernacle slash temple, they are from 30 to 50 years old. So that's the age range for the people who actually deal mm. with it with the tabernacle which frankly a 30 year old is fairly old for the oh, ancient yeah, world yeah. um just because that means that you've made it uh you are already like a parent of teenagers by the time you're 30 most likely <laughs> so um let's see all right so let's flip over to this let's see we're at 42 great so then I had you read just a little section out of chapter six, and I just wanted to discuss this because I'm going to take a guess and say you've heard this before. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to let you all know where it's from. There's a lot of rules that are in between what we just read and where we are. You can go back and read them if you want. Um, but just before this in chapter six, it discusses the Nazarites, which is one of those like, it's interesting. It relates to John the Baptist and Samson, but we don't actually have to know it. Um, <laughs> it. It's like another special group of people with special rules. But then we get this priestly benediction and it's just dropped in here. And the notes say that like, it doesn't really have any bearing on the text before or behind it. It's literally just one of those things that gets dropped in the text. Mm -hmm. And the Lord says to Moses, speak to Aaron as his sons and thus you shall say to them to bless Israel. And you shall say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put the name, they shall put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. So I'm just curious what you hear in this simple little blessing. Well, except for the last line, it was the usual benediction in, in my in the churches that I've been to. You don't do that particular no. benediction, but um, it was sort of standard, I think, when I, it, in the congregational church anyway. Mm -hmm. it, it's uh, except for the last part, which is. I know, think the last part is commentary not okay. part of the blessing okay yeah and i i i like the familiarity of it it feels that you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. you know the you know as you go forth remember that you are loved and blessed mm -hmm. and you say the same thing it's just not the same words mm -hmm. oh and you're special that's what yeah mary ellen I was just going to say, I think it's um, a beautiful message. Um, I think the repetitive nature that we've used with this is also beautiful because we, we're familiar with it and it, it, it gives you such a good feeling inside that, um, you know, we're, we're, for us, you're leaving a situation, I always think of it as a blessing at the end. Um, but whatever turmoil is in your life um the lord still blesses you and keeps you and makes his face to shine upon you that um it's just kind of a i don't know kind of pushes some of the troubles away as long as you're focusing on this is there a reason you don't use it Chris? Yes. Um, as much as I love it, I feel weird about taking something that was meant for the priest of Israel to say to the people when 
or the words are beautiful, but it it just sits at me odd to kind of assume that I have the ability to say this because it was meant for a certain class of people in granted it's a group that doesn't exist anymore i just don't want to feel like i'm pulling it out of context i love it like like, don't get me wrong i absolutely love this and i like i grew up hearing it as well it just doesn't feel like it's my place to say it i think Mm -hmm. it's out of respect in a way mary ellen is there anyone that you consider it is their place to say it? I think that is a decision that each person will need to make themselves. Um, I know it is used in a Jewish context, and it's just one of those things that I don't want. Or I'm, it's this is purely just a decision that I've made. It's not like authoritative across the board for me to say to other people. It's just like it's a it's a me decision that I I there are some people that don't know that this is a specifically Jewish blessing and it feels weird as a Christian pastor to kind of take it out of the Jewish context. But that's my decision. Yeah. Yeah, Larry. Well, after all, you're only quoting Aaron. I mean, Aaron was the one that was told to tell this to right. the people. So you're just quoting him. Fair enough. And I do think it's for all people. I mean, he said he said it to all the Israelites, but it's something that mm-hmm. all people could receive. Mm-hmm. Everybody, Christians, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, Mary Ellen. Oh, I, I'm just reflecting here. I'm not speaking to you, Chris. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just reflecting that we take so many things, obviously, from the Jewish tradition because we um, are not New Testament Christians. We are um, the total Bible Christians. And we take so many things from the Jewish tradition into our own, um, uh, I don't want to say beliefs, uh, something Um, along that line that you know it's like some of the psalms are just so beautiful and um i don't have any problem you know absorbing some of them into my life and tradition so um i i I guess i lost the point i was trying to make had a senior moment i'm so sorry um Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that we take a lot out of the Jewish traditions, um, and I don't have a problem with this one. I think this one is just mm-hmm. a beautiful message for Jews and Christians. So, mm-hmm. well, the twenty-third Psalm is really a universal Psalm. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. It, it's said in a lot of funerals. <laughs> the the thing that i am careful of often the the fancy seminary term is christian supersessionism which is the implication that the christian tradition is the true inheritors of god's covenant and have oh. replaced the jewish people mm. but, um it's this is something that there's more discussion about than there used to be but a lot of christian uh even like this is one of the reasons i'm not the biggest fan of the apostle paul is because paul is kind of like move aside jewish people the christians are the are the actual inheritors of god's Mm -hmm. tradition and it's that Mm -hmm. kind of sidelining of the community where yeah in things like this is if we see us in like as siblings with the Jewish tradition, I think that's when things can be shared beautifully. Mm-hmm. But uh, if we think that um, when things can be used in a way to say like the Christians are the true Israelites, that's when I'm kind of like, nah, what's going on here? <laughs> and I'm not saying that's always happening here, but that's one of the like background reasons why sometimes I stay away from Jewish things is because I don't like this, the idea that we have replaced them as God's chosen people. 
Mm. Yeah. So, but with that in mind, I actually do want to discuss some of the like the ins and outs of this blessing because I think knowing like reading what we have, we can actually understand the words a little bit better than maybe just hearing it as like in conclusion to a worship service. Mm. So when God, the first line is, may God bless you and keep you. Mm -hmm. So thinking of like Genesis and Exodus and what comes to mind with the blessing, like being like, may God bless you and keep you. Does anything specifically from those stories come out? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, well, his father blessed his sons and that sort of determined what they got. It was sort of a last will and testament type thing. Mm -hmm. Right. So like the blessing starts with Abraham where God says like you will be blessed to be a blessing. Mm -hmm. And then the like that family kept blessing certain people which the covenant of God would carry with that blessing. So now if Aaron is saying may, may God bless you it's kind of like the continuation of that Abrahamic covenant. Yeah, Mary Ellen? Well, I'm thinking of the Exodus, that okay. um, they had to have a major commitment, which they lost track of along the way or whatever. But anyway, they had to have um, a major commitment and belief that the Lord would bless and keep them on this journey that they were facing mm -hmm. and um you know how many years it took uh it you know it it was a trial to the people to keep in their minds that the lord would bless and keep them you know it's um even whatever stop okay keep means uh take care of that's what i'm thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so there's almost a form of trust in like God, like trust God that God will bless you and trust that God will keep you. Mm -hmm. um, the keeping part is also interesting when we think about like the incident with the golden calf. What was God's response after that happened? It was initially, you all can get, go to the you promised land. <laughs> you can go to the promised land, but I'm not going to stay with you. Like, I'm not going to be your God anymore. And Moses convinced God to like, no, keep us, stay with us. We are oh. your possession. We want you to keep us. Mm -hmm. Oh, keep, actually keep. Yeah. As opposed to give away. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> so may the Lord have the, uh, bless you like he blessed Abraham. May God keep you like God chose to keep the people even after they did wrong. You had to be convinced, though. What was that, Sue? You had to be convinced. Moses mm -hmm. said, yeah. no, no, I'll, I'll take care of it. He only, pop, pop, you know, uh, killed mm -hmm. fewer numbers, not everybody. Mm -hmm. So the Lord make his face shine upon you. Doesn't kill us. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So where else have we seen a shining face? Moses. Well, I heard someone say it. Moses. You're right. And Moses' face shone after what happened. Got too close. <laughs> Not too much <laughs> right so there's a proximity involved with a shining face so may god's face shine upon you it's actually like may god be near you near enough that like you can like the the shininess of moses's face got reflected may god's face shine upon you may you also be that close mm -hmm. And or so not only may God's face shine upon you, but be gracious with you. <laughs> what kind of images does that bring to mind of being gracious? <laughs> He's going to give you something. <laughs> gracious.
that's giving give special favor loving loving mm -hmm. yeah a sense He's of abundance caring. right loving mm -hmm. loving yeah um i think of someone who is gracious mm -hmm. and how it's personified in my realm and part of graciousness for me is they initiate kindness mm -hmm. and you know so i feel like this is saying the same to the lord initiate kindness to your people mm -hmm. um, not just be a responsive god but be someone who initiates good things too mm -hmm. So the third part of the blessing is the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. So what does it mean to lift up one's countenance upon you? Single, sort of single you out. Focus on you. Mm -hmm. mm. I'm looking up the definition of countenance because I thought it was face. What is it? Uh, I had to do the same thing, Mary Ellen. I, at least for my Google, it says self-control, the ability to hold it all in. Oh, really? Oh. Well, oh. that's that, that's countenance, not oh. countenance. I had countenance there we go. about. That uh, would be my dyslexia. You're right. Uh, <laughs> countenance, Oops. I believe, includes more than your face, too. It's like there, his whole being is given to you. I thought it was a face. Yeah. It is. Yes. But it's not yeah. skin deep. <laughs> okay. So the first definition is a person's face or facial expressions. The second definition is support, which is, I think, what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it is another, like, may God lift up his face to you. So, like, once again, it's that that face-to-face -face interaction kind of looking. Mm -hmm. And give you peace. Mary Ellen, mm -hmm. do I see a hand? Uh, well, one more thing on countenance. I have um, uh, one of my definitions is approval or favor, encouragement, moral support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That's sort of stretching the definition a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is number four. Yeah. So in all of this, the, the general, like, reflect, I know we're at time here. So what are some, like, final reflections on this blessing? Comforting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And since I've already heard it in Christian churches, I didn't necessarily think it was just, just a Jewish blessing. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny because when I opened, one of my initial questions was, do you have any associations with the book of numbers? Turns out you do. You just didn't know it. <laughs> oh, I didn't know it was there. <laughs> <laughs> this is one that I wish I could give like greater context to of like, this is why it was said, but it's literally just dropped in here as just a blessing, which is, I think, absolutely lovely. So uh, any, or since we're at time, is there any final thoughts for today is kind of our flyby view of the book of numbers kind of dipping our toes in hearing one blessing that's kind of just dropped in there any initial thoughts for this book there's more to it than i realized mm -hmm. I, I didn't realize it had a lot of stories in it like you described 
Well, it's interesting that it, 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 uh, the Jewish name for it is in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I think it's a much more descriptive name than just numbers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My hope is I can get you all to love this book because I think it is a, a, a darling book. It just underrated. <laughs> <laughs> all right well do you know what as a pr instead of praying for you all today i'm just gonna say this benediction once again it seems fitting mm -hmm. okay so be blessed as we go out for today may the lord bless you all and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious with you may the lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and by this you shall be blessed, and you will have the name of God upon your hearts. Amen. 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 So, anyway, thank you, Chris. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy the sunshine today. Yeah. <laughs> well, a while, anyway. You're right. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Good week.